Race day in Melbourne, Australia's sporting capital. All eyes on the Grand Prix at Albert Park. It's curtain up for F1 2002 on ITV1. Straight away. He may just have a tenth or two in hand on Michael, and it's less than a tenth, but it's enough right now. The Ferraris flying round Albert Park, stage for round one of the championship. The weather, it's poor. It's been wet, there's heavy cloud around, temperature hovering around 17 degrees. Hello there, good morning to you all. It is great to have your company and we can promise you a jam-packed pre-race show until the race gets underway at 3 a.m. your time. Tony Jardine and Mark Blundell are with me now. Mark, how about this weather? A lot of rain around this morning. It's tough enough for the drivers getting back into the groove in race one. Extra problems over this. Extra problems indeed, but that's my interest at the moment. It's the weather, reliability and the rookies. So we're not far away from seeing what's going to go on. Yeah, Tony, we've been coming here for a few years now. We've never experienced anything like this, have we? No, we have in Adelaide. We had some very, very heavy rain down there where races were stopped inside 14 laps. There were spectacular crashes and everything. We're not used to this at all. It's real pommy weather. Yeah, we don't know what we're going to get. Everybody looking up towards the skies. In warm-up this morning, though, they were all over the shop. Yeah, that was uh, Kimi Raikkonen, who I have to say has been doing a brilliant job uh, on his debut for McLaren. Look at him <laughs> collecting that one all together. And uh, the master himself, for Michael Schumacher, just checking out his exit routes, as he normally does, in case he has a few off the track. And... Uh, Rookies as well, as you said, going for it. Now, let me just uh, remind you that uh, ITV1 is the place to follow the championship. 17 races across five continents. British Grand Prix at Silverstone on July the 7th. The French Grand Prix a bit later this year because of the Football World Cup and that three-week break once again in August. I want to bring you right up to date uh, with the newcomers, the movers, and the new team all battling for glory. Ted Kravitz is going to be our new pit lane reporter and he will be working alongside Louise Goodman. That's right, Jim. As usual, we are going to be taking you right to the very heart of the action, bringing you all the news, views and opinions live from the pit lane. And as you would expect, there is going to be plenty to talk about here at the first race in Melbourne. There have been no major changes to the rules and regulations this season, but we've got new drivers, new engines and new cars, apart from a couple with a bit of history and one careful owner. You wouldn't exactly call this Ferrari second-hand, but it is last year's model. The Italians race it in Melbourne because of its bulletproof reliability and guaranteed speed. Title favourite Michael Schumacher is eyeing his fifth world championship, and he's partnered again by Brazilian Rubens Barrichello. 2002 promises to be the best chance yet for David Coulthard to step up into the spotlight and take his place at the McLaren helm. But new teammate Kimi Raikkonen will be doing his best to ensure that David doesn't have it all his own way. Williams start year three of their alliance with BMW and Ralph Schumacher will be able to build on his three wins of last year. In his way is the hard-as-nails Colombian Juan Pablo Montoya, looking to take on anyone by the name of Schumacher. Sauber were the sensation of 2001, but can the Swiss outfit repeat that success? This year, Nick Heidfeld is joined by baby-faced Brazilian newcomer, 20-year-old Felipe Massa. Jordan Honda welcomed Giancarlo Fisichella back to the team after his four years away at Benetton, and they pair him up with Japan's most promising driver ever, British Formula 3 hotshot Takuma Sato. There have been a few changes at BAR over the winter months. Not on the driver front, Jacques Villeneuve is once again partnered by seasoned French campaigner Olivier Panis. But there's a new boss running the show this season. The man now charged with pointing the team in the right direction is ex benetton boss Dave Richards. 
What was Benetton is now Renault F1. The French team has English boy wonder Jensen Button looking to up his game after a troubled 2001. And partnering him is Italian Jano Trulli, who's fast but needs some big race finishes. Jaguar will be hoping to leap up the F1 ranks this year, but will the big cat have the claws? Eddie Irvine is now the oldest driver in Formula One, whilst Pedro de la Rosa once again brings his calming influence to the team. Arrows are using exactly the same Cosworth engine as Jaguar this year, and Prost refugee Heinz Harald Frensen will hope it can power him back into the points. In the other seat is sponsor's favourite, Enrique Bonaldi. The Minardi team are still the Formula One minnows, but Alex Jung has helped attract a valuable cash injection from Malaysian sponsors, and Australian debutant Mark Webber is hoping he'll be the man to give the team something to smile about. Giant Japanese car company Toyota joined Formula One for the first time and take their place at the end of the pit lane. If drivers got championship points for scary looks to camera, Scotland's Alan McNish would be world champion by now. He's joined in the other seat by the experienced Finn Mika Salo. And Toyota had a very respectable qualifying session as well. But uh, Tony, let's talk about Michael Schumacher. I mean, can you see anything there that gives his rivals hope? I can't see any chinks in the armour at all. In fact, I see a lot of worrying signs. The fact that, one, the guy, because there was no winter testing in December, the guy was bored and was phoning Ferrari and saying, let me drive, let me drive. He's at his peak, he's still at his peak, but at 33 years of age, he's still absolutely awesome and he just lives to drive. But there's a feeling he, he might just lose his appetite for thing, things when someone starts beating him regularly, perhaps even your man Montoya. I think that may be the case, Jim, that if somebody does start to beat him on a regular basis, he will sort of like start to back away. But you have to say at this point, you know, if you could sell confidence in boxes, that guy would make a fortune anyway. He's just, he just got so much of it. And there's nobody down the pit lane at present with a package to attack him. We saw last season Tony Mika Hackman sort of fall out of love with the sport, didn't we? Could you see possibly the same thing happening to Schumacher? Only if someone starts beating him, as Mark said. But it's uh, Schumacher Sr., his father, who said to Michael, now beware. When the young champion uh, heir apparent comes along, don't try going with him because that's when it gets dangerous. That's when you could really hurt yourself. That son is the time to retire. So uh, okay. that's what 21 others are waiting for. Absolutely, but it is still Ferrari who are continuing to uh, set the standard. They've won the last two, uh, last three constructors' championships. Add to that, Michael Schumacher's back-to-back -back titles. They come here with last year's car, but they've been awesome. The unveiling of Ferrari's new racing creation is always a special occasion in Italy. But never mind about it, because they're not going to use it yet. The 2002 car made a late debut in mid-February. And despite trying it out at various Italian circuits, Ferrari were unsure that it would last a race distance. Basically, we haven't had enough uh, days of testing. We were pretty confident after we've been testing in Fiorano with the new car. Then we went to Mugello, we had a day of rain, we couldn't really find out what's the problem. And then we had a, a final day of dry, then we had a little problem, we stopped, then uh, we, we lost that day again. And then at one point, before we actually had the last day of testing, when we made the announcement, uh, we had to take the, the decision, what we're going to concentrate on, because uh, concentrating on the old car needed some work as well in preparation, which we did, and the reason is not enough kilometers we have done not enough time. So the question is, when will the new car make its race debut? Uh, we don't know. I mean, we, we, we're hoping to have it here, so we obviously hope to have it in uh, Malaysia, and uh, we find out where it's going to be. So Ferrari race in Melbourne with an updated version of the car that won the Japanese Grand Prix last October. Together with other technical improvements, the pace of tyre development has made it even quicker. A lot of teams would wish to have an old car like we have, uh, honestly. We have improved the engine horsepower, we have improved a little bit uh, uh, details uh, around, which I don't want to get into, obviously, but it will be faster than what we had in Suzuka. How much? Well, that's enough. It certainly has been enough so far. In practice, the car's immediately been quick, as the team have all the best setups on file from last year. With the other teams still sorting out their new cars, Ferrari are looking almost unstoppable. Well, at the moment, but there'll be a point when uh, it may not be the right choice and we'll have to reconsider uh, that situation. 
In the meantime, there's more bad news for Ferrari's rivals. The new car is busy being tested back in Europe and is significantly faster than the 2001 car. Michael is after another title. I mean, it's clear after winning last year and the year before the championship, we would like to win another one, but then we all know how unpredictable sport is. You never can program it. We work very hard for it. We're going to do everything. It's in our hands uh, to secure the championship, but it's going to be a tough fight on. Schumacher and Barrichello in those Ferraris quickest in a wet morning warm-up as well. We're all wondering here about the weather, about what it's going to do. Ted is down there uh, in the pits, and I think there's a bit of a dodgy old uh, black cloud right behind you, Ted. What can you tell us? There is a bit of a big cloud behind us, Jim. Yeah, you might be able to see that on the screen. Well, they do say it's very difficult to predict the weather around here, but if you have to do it, ask a local. Well, you can't get more local than this. The Bureau of Meteorology in Melbourne. Now, this is the interesting passage. The conditions for the race, the Australian Grand Prix between 2 and 4 p.m. this afternoon, mostly cloudy with one or two light showers in the area. The risk of showers should decrease over the course of the race. Now, what that means is that it's going to rain sooner rather than later, and that's certainly what that cloud would point to. Having said that, these guys said it wasn't going to rain during qualifying yesterday, and we all know what happened then. Absolutely, Ted. I'm not too sure how much wise we are after that, but I think we're still guessing, along with everybody else, to be quite honest. Jaguar, for instance, got it totally wrong uh, in qualifying yesterday, and we'll just have to wait and see. Let's wait and see and talk about the new kids on the block. Uh, well, three of them anyway, because uh, the Scott Alan McNish is getting a belated Formula One debut at the age of 32. Here's Louise again. It feels a bit like the first day of the new school term here in Melbourne and there are some new faces in the class of 2002, including Britain's Alan McNish, who's making his Formula One debut with the fledgling Toyota team. We are a new team to Formula One, but I think we've got to remember that Toyota have been very successful in other forms of motorsport and hopefully people perceive us as a professional outfit. As drivers, Mick and myself, and I certainly know from my point of view, we're going to go out there and give it everything we've got. And, uh, you know, if you sit on the back row of the grid, we're not going to be obviously entirely happy. We want to be up there ahead of it. I can't give you a definite, yes, I'll be happy with this, but I won't be happy with that right now. It just depends on some circumstances. Some of the most satisfying races I've ever had were not necessarily the best results, but maybe the best performance by a team. Mark Webber has been flying high with the Australian Air Force this week, but predictions are he'll be back down to earth with a bump in his debut year with Minardi. I'm expecting it to be a tough season, I have to say. Uh, it's it's going to be tough driving as hard as you can and coming to the bit lane and knowing that you know the progress might not be as, as, as quick as uh, you want it to be, which is uh, for a competitive person it's tough to swallow sometimes, but I have to... Uh, adjust my goals and, and, and push forward and, and do the best I can with, with what I have. We're working with something which is something, it's very hard to get the rewards back which is what we're, we're here for in some ways and, and, and being, having nice results and nice performances helps the whole team not just the drivers so uh, it's, it's, it's character building. Fabers Felipe Massa is the latest sensation from South America. The young Brazilian has been very quick in testing, but a little unpredictable too. I made some mistakes because uh, I always want to drive on the limit and on the winter test I think it's, it's not important to drive on, on the limit. It's important to, to find the best solution for, for, for the car, you know. And, but I think I will, I, I will learn it. Are you finding all of this difficult to cope with? Um, I'm 20 years old. Uh, I'm a little bit young. I think was was quite was quite quick to arrive here, but um, I think it's it's better to arrive young because you you you, you can learn much more. British F3 champion Takuma Sato makes his Grand Prix debut just five years after sitting in a car for the very first time. As a child, he had to content himself with make-believe racing on his bicycle. Obviously, you haven't got a license yet, so you have you cannot do driving, but obviously dreaming, dreaming. And uh, when you're a bicycle, in your mind, you're always driving a car. And uh, the finally, when I was 19 years, I got a chance because in the school, in the Suzuka racing, so there was age limitation. You have to be under 20 years old. And that is, for me, the last chance. So I said to my parents, please give me a chance. Terrific new faces, dreams coming true. Uh, so Sterling Moss, 
and welcome you to our studio. Thank you. Always uh, was a great pleasure. You always pop in and see us in Melbourne, and it's a regular little joy. It is indeed. It's wonderful to see so much youth, you know. It really takes me back so many years and to see these guys rearing to go, and what a job they've got there. Yeah, what a this, job. This would be the sort of situation you'd really... Oh, absolutely. Nobody knowing quite what's going on yeah, and I, everyone... Yeah, but I liked it when I was older and I knew more what it, what it had to... You know, when I was really young, then it wasn't so good. And the, these chaps are really young. But uh, and what the weather's going to do, it's got to be very interesting, I think. I mean, how can we possibly do anything other than say it's a Schumacher race? Because really, it isn't just Michael. It's not only him, it's the car and Rory Byrne. Rory still says, do this, do that. And Michael is good enough, he can do whatever it is. So it's pretty tough, isn't it? You've, you've got terrific admiration for the way Michael Schumacher goes about the business of being yeah. a Formula One driver. He is a very, very professional man, I must say. He does it extremely well. And, and whatever, whenever there's a warm-up or this or that, the other, the others do a certain time, Michael comes out and says, well, that's what you should do. Then he pulls off. Yeah. And, you know, that to me is the sign of a champion. I've seen it before with people like Fangio. Well, we're going to have a, have a word now with, with the top British driver, David Coulthard, insisting that he can beat Michael Schumacher. Martin Brundle caught up with David Coulthard at his hotel in Monaco. Do you start the season thinking Michael and Ferrari are the people to beat? You've got to say they are the benchmark based on last season. None of us have any other information than that uh, to, to base our, our future prediction. The regulations haven't changed a great deal. So you have to presume, in fact they haven't changed at all, so you have to presume that at the very least they'll have the performance they had last season and potentially they'll have a better performance. So I knew in the design of our new car it had to be better because we were not consistently as good as Ferrari during last season. The new car is better. Now have we taken a step slightly in front of Ferrari? Well, that would be a dream to believe that's the case. Um, there's no question that Michael is a benchmark. He's a, he has all of the attributes that you require in terms of qualifying pace, uh, race pace, aggression that's required to, to go racing. Is he beatable? Yes. That's the bottom line. The conversation's over. You don't need any more than that. Can I beat Michael Schumacher? Yes. Have I beaten Michael Schumacher? Yes. Will you beat Michael Schumacher? I don't know. Can I? Yes. Will I beat him this year? I don't know. It depends on a number of factors of which no one has the crystal ball. And, you know, a friend of mine has commented that racing drivers have balls, but none of them are crystal. But you've got to beat Williams as well, because in reality they were faster than you at the end of last year, and they're talking about a stonking new engine for 2002. Good stability, Montoya should be up to speed. You know, Ralph, pretty much under pressure, wasn't he? Ralph, with, with Montoya's mm. speed and aggression. You know, where do, where do you see them? Well, first of all, I, I think I'm probably being a bit closer to it. I, I don't necessarily see this big sort of uh, you know, difference between Ralph and Montoya that people were saying. The fact is, Ralph was stronger in the first half of the season, and Montoya was a little bit stronger in, in a few races at the end. That, to me, seems quite balanced. I, I, I don't see this big sort of, you know, someone used the expression of him being this sort of cannonball being fired into the heart of Formula One. Well, it's a sort of, you know, it's more like an inflatable beach ball. You know, he's quite, you know, I don't see, <laughs> I haven't seen him sort of, you know, one overtaking manoeuvre to Michael, which was a great manoeuvre, there's no question about that. Yeah. But, you know, it takes more than that to win a championship. What's a realistic target for you this year? Oh, the World Championship. The that, only target, really? That is a target. Um, what, in the early days for Kim, Kimi, when he gets his first podium, that's going to be a real buzz, because that's his first podium. If he finishes third in Melbourne, he's going to be happy. If he finishes second, he's going to be even happier. If he wins, he's going to be delighted. Anything other than a win for me is going to be a little bit disappointing. You know, you, you have to realistically expect that you, you can't win every Grand Prix. And clearly, no one has in, in the history of the sport. But it's about race wins. Can, do we have the package to win in Melbourne? I honestly don't know, but I believe in the people, I believe in the resources, and uh, it, it, it comes down to probably three teams that have the capability of sustaining a, a, a championship challenge through the year, and that's ourselves, Williams and Ferrari. Well, Sir Sterling, I wouldn't uh, dare to ask a knight of the realm what his crystal balls are like, but do you think <laughs> we've just uh, spoken there to the world champion this year? I, I, frankly, no, I don't. I, I, would I, would I would love him to win it because I think he'd be a good world champion. He's a good-looking bloke. He talks in the right way. He does dresses properly. And all, the, all the things are the good. But I don't think yet that he is ready to take over the mantle, no. And I think it'll be a, a few years yet before Michael goes. Um, what does he lack then, David, in your view? Not speed. But he lacks tactical knowledge. 
I, I, well, this is my feeling, is that he can t turn in the speeds, but it isn't just speed, it is being able to do go fast when you have to go fast, passing when it's the right time to pass, going in for pit stops when you should go in. And he's helped, obviously, I mean, by his, by his pit crew, but uh, I don't think they're up to beating Ferrari. Do you think it's going to help him at all that uh, Mika Hakkinen has gone and the team might be looking to him more this season for his leadership? Not with Kimi. I reckon Kimi's got to push him as much Kimi as anybody, right, frankly. I think Kimi has got great potential. I don't mean now or necessarily this race, but he is fast, he's young, he's hungry. And there's no doubt he's talented. So uh, I think he's the one you watch. Tony, do you agree with what uh, Sterling's saying there? Yeah, I mean, it's the lack of consistency that's been there. And I agree with Sir Sterling. You know, the speed is there and the overtaking manoeuvres, as he put in Brazilian Grand Prix to win last year. But reliability factor really plagued him last year. How many times was he stuck on the grid when the electronics went? Monte Carlo, he did a superb pole position, electronics went and he, he ended up starting from the back of the grid. He's the nearly man, unfortunately. He's got to convert it and make it stick. OK, uh, we're going to go back to Monte Carlo. More now from David Coulthard telling it like it is. First, his views on Eddie Irvine. I'm trying to be honest here. That's the best policy, isn't it? Um, I think Eddie is a good racing driver. I respect him on the track. He's, he's clean. He still has the speed, there's no question. Where I believe he lets himself down, only in opinion, is he's got too much to say. You know, too much to say all the time. You know, he's taking on the mantle of, uh, of the sort of the mouthpiece of Formula One. He's good copy for the, 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 the dailies, for the tabloid boys. Uh, got an opinion and everything, so we'll always go to him for that. And uh, you know, I wonder if just focusing on, on what he's about. He's contracted to race and test and develop the Jaguar racing car. If he spent as much time doing that as he does in all the other things, then it, it, it must improve the performance somewhere along the line. Pulling no punches then. By the way, if you have ever seen Eddie Irvine lost for words, I doubt it, but you're going to before the Australian Grand Prix. But what do you think uh, about Eddie Irvine at the moment? I think that Nicky Lauda's got to learn to speak Irish, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, if he was half as fast as he thinks he is, he'd be, he'd be moderately quick, you know. Now, I think he is a good racing driver, as he said, but, but, but to have that millstone around your neck as, a, as an owner or something, I think it's pretty tough. But this really. is them in qualifying uh, yesterday, Stern. I'm going to talk a bit more about the qualifying session later on, and they had a horrendous time, the Jaguars. Yes, I think he went better today than yesterday, actually. But, well, uh, they couldn't go much worse, could they? Well, that's true. No, he couldn't. Um, yeah, and yeah. Irvine now the oldest man on the grid. I mean, do you yeah, think he's got that limited does, time here? It doesn't or? matter because he's got the most experience as well. I, I think age, age until it gets you down, I don't think matters. And I think that he's you know fairly fit and so on. And, and uh, therefore, I don't think age matters at all. I mean, Fangio was 46 when he took his last title. Mm. Now I agree he wasn't racing in this sort of car. That's all true. But but where one thing goes off, another one carries on. And I think therefore that is still a pretty quick, sir. I may well, say. Yeah, still racing not, around. I would. Yeah, but getting one of those kind of front the hell just better. A bit more training, you'd be right. I'd rather be here talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 chat, you chat very well as well, by the way. Have you, you popped round to see one or two of your fans in the Sterling Moss stand here, packed yeah, out yes, again, well, I see? Well, yes, but it's not a very interesting stand, actually. It's on the straight pitch, you know. <laughs> and so that's, they don't give me the interesting stands, really. It's like one on the corner. Mm. Just, just b before you leave us, um, just give us your thoughts then about the upcoming uh, Australian Grand Prix in a nutshell. Well, I'm glad it's here. It's, it is the first one. It should be the first one. It is the best of the year. I don't care what the race turns out. It is the place to be, let's face it. Wonderful place. These people are sportsmen. I mean, it was absolutely fabulous. I think we're going to see an interesting race. I don't know that it's going to be exciting. I think it'll be interesting and tactically. That'll be quite interesting. If the rain comes on, what tyres to start on? Do you go intermediate? That, to me, is going to be a lot of the interest, which is up to you to interpret. Mm. It's going to be quite difficult. And at the end of it, on the podium? Oh, Michael. I mean, really, it has to be Michael. My, it, Rubens is going well. I don't want to overlook Rubens because he's, he's an A, a nice guy, but he's not Michael. Right. Good. Thanks for dropping in. Thank you. See you next year, if not before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, there's going to be a bit more of Sterling Moss a little bit later in the programme. Thanks very much, Sterling. Not driving, though. Not driving. No, no. But we are now going to drive uh, this street circuit. It always is a big test. It's tough on brakes. Who knows? It might be wetter this time round. We're going to go around with Juan Pablo Montoya, an apprehensive debutant here last season, now a title contender. And here's Martin Brundle to talk the Williams round in the dry, by the way. Let's join Juan Pablo Montoya in the Williams for a lap of this fabulous Melbourne circuit. He'll be staying to the left-hand side of the pit straight because it's a right-hander at turn one, building to over 185 miles an hour 
in seventh, break at 90 metres before the corner. Minimum speed, 80 miles an hour. Turn two opens nicely, well over 100 by the exit. Bring the car gently to the left, over 180 miles an hour once again. You can break very late, but smoothly into three. Coast in, just 60 miles an hour. Turn four is ahead of you. Clip the kerb on the inside. Put the throttle down very smoothly. Five immediately. Sometimes it's flat, but not yet for Montour as he heads down to six at 175 miles an hour. It's slightly blind over the crest. 75 in third gear. Seven opens easily. Eight absolutely flat out at 160 miles an hour. 175 now before turn nine. Ripley under braking. Touch the kerb on the inside. A little bit of grass too. Ten opens easily build up to 180 miles an hour. Those white lines are very apparent from the camera. You don't really notice them behind the wheel of a Formula One car. Look for that first apex at 11. Same for 12, difficult to see. Mind the grass on the exit, over 180 miles an hour again. A gentle right-hander towards, unlucky for some, turn 13. You'll be doing 70 on the apex. Well over 100 before the exit. A short squirt down to 14. A relatively easy corner, opens for you nicely on the exit. Don't blow it now, you're very near the end of the lap. A very pedestrian left-hander, just 45 miles an hour. Brought it very quickly to the left, that's good. And this is where the Williams is losing out to the Ferrari all weekend, but so far so good for Montoya as he heads over the start-finish line once again. Australian Air Force buzzing us uh, overhead. Now there is a strong feeling that uh, Juan Pablo Montoya is shaping up as a genuine challenger to Michael Schumacher's title. He's in the frame to do that. He's been chatting to Ted. I'm pretty happy with what we got. Uh, he's working quite well. Uh, I would, you know, I think there's you know, a bit more to come. So we'll see, you know, we have to really wait and see what happens. Last year was a different challenge. It was a challenge to prove that I could do the job. I know I can do the job. Now it's a matter of putting it together always. So, you know, learn how to put it together. You know, I'm still, I'm always going to be, you know, 10 years behind Michael of experience in Formula 1 and about 5 than Ralph. But, you know, I think I've, you know, I've improved myself quite good through the year. A lot's been said about uh, you and Michael for the title. Is that something you see? I don't think about it really. I'll just get on with it and, and if we've got a chance to win, we'll win it. We'll give it a go at least. But these Schumacher boys, they're quick, aren't they? Yeah, you know, they're quick. But, you know, they're humans. You know, I'm going to give Ralph a hard time. Uh, we're very similar this morning in times. Um, so I'm pretty happy. If we could get into a top three, it'd be fantastic. You know, anything better than last year is good. You know, if the car is capable of winning, you'll go for the win. If the car is capable of finish fifth, you'll try to finish fifth. you got to try to do the best you can with the package you got. He's got his sights uh, on the title. But what about his uh, teammate, Ralph Schumacher, and his glasses? Is he going to drive in those or what? <laughs> no, there's a possibility that he will drive in glasses, but um, I think like Jacques Villeneuve, as we spoke with Tony, I think he uses contact lenses, but uh, maybe he's going to be the Harry Potter of Formula 1 this year. <laughs> the dodgy bins they are, look at that. <laughs> They've had to make a special helmet so he can get these 14 varieties of glasses he tried on uh, inside the helmet, but he says he can now see the, the corners coming up now. But it's right, he's wearing contact lenses to drive yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Good, okay, right. We'll try and keep you in the clear. Next, we're going to be popping into a really good uh, function at the Royal Albert Hall. We're going to get your views via the ITVF1 website, plus the story of qualifying how Rubens Barrichello got the better of the reigning champion. back with us in Melbourne. Dry at the moment. Record crowds for the Fosters Australian Grand Prix. Today's estimate around 130,000. A bit like the first big day back at work for the drivers, but they've enjoyed their holidays.
Kimi Raikkonen, the mountaineer there, top of the uh, mountain, Berbier in the Swiss Alps, the Australian Air Force, they love to do this, they buzz us every day here at Albert Parker in Melbourne. Things were buzzing at the Albert Hall when I went there, a terrific charity night, all sorts of glamour, and Beverly Turner was there. London's Royal Albert Hall for the 2002 Grand Prix party and we're going to be asking the really important questions such as what's Carol Vorderman going to wear and can Murray Walker sing? We're not just here to have fun, aren't we? No, we were, right? <laughs> well, that answers one question. Carol's our host tonight alongside our very own Tony Jardine and the emphasis is on fun but with a serious message. It was originally the British Brain and Spine Foundation but we've had so much help from Canada, from Austria, from Germany, from France and as you know the Formula One community is very international. We dropped the British title and it's the Brain and Spine Foundation now because it is an international affair. No shortage of familiar faces from the world of F1 and beyond. F1 Team 2, a very familiar face. Damon, good to see you. Tell us what you're doing here tonight. Um, I'm playing with my band, which is called the Conrods, and uh, we're playing uh, a couple of songs that are kind of loosely connected to cars, so we kind of pick songs that are car-related, which is appropriate. And you're in good company. Jules Holland, yeah. Ronnie Wood. Tell me who else. Well, yeah, with, uh, with uh, Jules' band, we've got Jules Holland's band, which is about 97 people, I think. Um, and we've got uh, Ronnie Wood out there, we've got Mick Huckner, we've got Edwin Starr. Oh, God, who have I forgotten? I mean, there's, there's loads of people who are out there uh, who've given themselves to tonight for this uh, charity event. You still turn me on. You can make me whole again. Are you looking forward to seeing Atomic Kitten play? I, I don't know what that is, I'm sorry. You'll have to have to give me some information. It's a girl band. Oh, Lord. Oh, I see. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, <laughs> rather well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's a lot of musical people in Formula One, but I am not one of them. Really. But that voice, Murray, that voice, you must be able to sing. <laughs> well, I could clear the Albert Hall, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. <laughs> There's people who are really interested in sort of uh, uh, F1, the motorsport, and kind of want a bit of a boogie. It's people that are kind of combining their interests. Are you interested in Formula One? Are you a fan? I like the motor racing, yeah, I like F1 racing. I like, like motor cars generally. I like transport. I quite like heavy haulage, although I keep that hushed up. It's a fantastic thing to be uh, associated with tonight, especially for the charity. And also, my big regret tonight, I walked by Sterling Moss and somebody said, you just walked by Sterling Moss. I said, I would never do that. That finale was really something tonight, wasn't it? Yeah, no one knew what they were playing. I know, <laughs> that's what I mean. Terrific night that uh, last month, Tony. Um, Atomic Kitten might have been lost on the F1 Dr. Sid Watkins, but his foundation did well out of it. They did very well. And uh, it's Chaz Cole, my musical mate, who helps put it on for us, and Bernie helps us a lot. But you've got to go outside the paddock gates to help promote the sport. And at the same time, you can make money for Sid's charity. It's all well, well worthwhile. Good. OK, OK. Let us reflect the qualifying hour here in Melbourne. It was really the qualifying 20 minutes because of the rain and a red flag. But uh, Ferrari's 150. 50th pole mark and uh, Barrichello on pole and Michael Schumacher looking fantastic. Michael Schumacher was so impressive because he only put in a couple of laps and then he came out still with worn tyres from the previous run and stuck this lap in and put himself on pole but it wasn't long before Barrichello came knocking on the door and just shaved like half a tenth away from him and took the pole. But they're both driving in an extremely good way this, at this point. It was very, very difficult to get things right, wasn't it, Tony? Montoya suffered because he, he left it too late, but Ralph Schumacher made the most of the dry early conditions. Yeah, it was be a little bit disappointing, obviously, for the BMW Williams cars. And uh, Ralph said he had a touch of understeer, um, but 
nevertheless, it's still quite a solid performance with that, that third place. This is reputedly the most powerful engine in Formula 1 at the moment, this new BMW power pack, and uh, Ralph using it to the best advantage there, but it's going to be one heck of a battle between him and Montoya this year. Some, the Michelin's and the Bridgestone situation, though the core conditions, the Michelin is just not working. Mm. And Bridgestone's very happy the way that uh, the Ferraris are responding to them, but uh, it should be a show. Formula One, and it was pretty grim for the for the crowd here. And I think Michael Schumacher might have thought, I'm going to go out in the wet and put on a bit of a style here. Show them what it's all about. Well, I think just a professional Michael Schumacher again. Everybody sat back in the garages, took it easy. But um, he went out there in the wet conditions with four tanks and just put that show on, as you say. But that was all just data gathering. He was getting all the information he could for today's race. Mm, absolutely. OK, then, um, Tony, let us just uh, take us through the grid for the first race of uh, 2002. Well, Rubens uh, Barrichello, his fourth pole position, he's done them in wet conditions so far. It's another double red. It was a Ferrari front row last year, just five thousandths of a second Schumacher behind him. Ralph Schumacher there in third place. David Coulthard happy with the chassis, but just behind him, McLaren debutant Kimi Raikkonen doing a very good job. Montoya said he was blocked by Fisichella, lost eight tenths of a second. Jarno Trulli on his debut for Renault, he's well ahead of his teammate Fisichella, happy to be back home at uh, Jordan. Philippe Massa, who you're all saying, you'll hear a lot more of him because he outqualified Heidfeld, a star in the making, but not happy with his qualifying in 11th place. Panis outqualifying Villeneuve there, who was in 13th place. Mika Salo, welcome, come back to him after a year away. And Frenson, nice to have him back on the grid in the Arrows. McNish making his Grand Prix debut in 16th place. And then we have Benaldi, alongside him, Mark Webber, the other debutant for Australia, and Jaguars. Uh, the worst qualifying performance for Irvine since he's been there and behind the similarly engined arrows Alex Young 21st and after uh, the big crash the stewards allowed Sato back in on 22nd place although he didn't qualify. All 22 go then I'm pleased that Sato has been allowed back in as we sample the driver's views though watch out for a speechless Eddie Irvine. I mean a pole position to start with is new for me uh, I've been fighting all my career for that uh, it doesn't mean much there's no points uh, scoring in there, but it, it's it's good just to be there and to you know we have a, a, a I have a clear run tomorrow after the start. We both up front. I rather would have been in first, but uh, Rubens has done a good job, so he deserves to be up there. We knew that it was going to be tight with the rain, so I tried to get a good clear lap in it. I must admit I didn't think it was going to be that quick, uh, but yeah. that is. <laughs> When we spoke to you at the beginning of this weekend, you said you weren't sure if it was the best idea to bring the old car. You must be pretty sure it's a good idea now. You know, afterwards, you're always more clever. <laughs> Realistically, I don't think we were looking at the front row unless Ferrari had a problem. So, you know, their package, uh, their, their combination is working better around the circuit. So uh, what I think we realistically could aim for was uh, to be quicker than Williams. And obviously, Ralph managed to, to get a lap when it counted. Historically here, there's been quite a few cars that have broken down and uh, you know you can pick up a position or two just purely because of other people's problems. Uh, we obviously have done quite a lot of work trying to keep that in mind but uh, it's going to be our first race and uh, so therefore there's always a few gremlins that can creep in. But uh, I, I believe that we've got a reasonable chance just to progress forward. I don't know how far forward though. Eddie, how would you sum up today? Uh, it's a bit disappointing. Um, knew, knew we were going to be around there, obviously with the rain and our, the weather form, cast man getting it so wrong, it, it caught us off guard a bit. Um, um, where are you for tomorrow? I mean, is it a situation that you just need to go around in circles and learn about the car? Um, I think we've done enough going around in circles. No, we need to... Um, I really don't know. Um, it's not often we see you lost I, There's nothing to say, there's nothing to say, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very bad and there's nothing to say. But surely, I mean, you knew it was going to be bad, is it worse than you were expecting? I, the car handled very bad before and it was slow. Yesterday, for the first time, the car handled reasonably well and it was still slow. So that's more worrying than handling bad and being slow. You know, if it, if, it, if it handles reasonably good and you're still not doing lap times, where do you find the lap time? You know, that, that's, that's the worrying thing. That's the, that's the new thing that's been thrown in for us to try and understand. You normally if you put a gag on him, you keep talking, um, unheard of. Normally shoots from the lip. 
lipless in Australia <laughs> because of a lifeless Jaguar, apparently. But he has said he'd go through the season, but if it continues on like that, he said you'd have to be a masochist to stay. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're in for a quiet year. But it's the same old story, isn't it? <laughs> Is it? When you're winning, you can say whatever you want, everybody wants to listen. But when things are not going right, keep quiet, get your head down and get on with the job. Mm, but it, it's, it's something of a crisis, an early crisis uh, at uh, Jaguar. Let's just remind you of some of the conditions here that they experienced in warm-up. And first of all, uh, Mika Salo, uh, we welcome him back uh, to Formula One, Tony, and one or two problems for him in the, in the Toyota. It's a bit of a shame for Mika this because he had moved out of the way uh, for the Ferrari there. But look, look at those huge big white lines in the wet. He just slipped and uh, touched the barrier and did a little bit of damage, uh, most unfortunate. Yeah, and Mark, it's always very green, this circuit. They only use it once a year on this Grand Prix weekend. And cars fly by all the time, don't they? And they were flying off in warm, a whole, a whole series of them. Exactly that, Jim. You know, bear in mind that there's 12 months since we've all been here. This is really, you know, roads for everybody who drives around Melbourne every day to work. There's oil, there's all sorts of stuff down there. Rain, normal roads, 800 horsepower. Doesn't matter whether you're a world champion or even a rookie, you're still going to fly off the road. Yeah. And uh, there, there's the rookie, Alex Young, in the Minardi, finding uh, going a little bit tough there. The Australians are very excited about their Minardis because uh, they're owned by Paul Stoddart, uh, a Melbourne lad, and uh, the main driver is Mark uh, Webber. Go, go, Webber, the crowds have been saying. I'm, I'm looking for Mark Webber down there, Louise. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, you haven't got him uh, with you, have you? Yeah, I tell you what, Jim, Minardi have been rivaling Ferrari for attention this weekend. Paul, you have just had the most fantastic welcome, haven't you? Unbelievable, Lou. It really has been since we landed here last Sunday in the 747. It has not stopped. You've obviously made a few friends whilst you've been here. Absolutely. Sarah Jane here and our little friend, the boxing kangaroo. It's full on this weekend and we're really looking forward. I mean, it's been fantastic already, but, you know, Mark's P18 for his first ever race. I don't know how much better this dream can get. Yeah, the Aussie team giving a debut to another young Australian driver. That must make you very proud. It really does. And you mustn't forget our first ever Malaysian driver, Alex, as well. P21 for him. At the end of the day, we're fighting against big budgets, but we're here. We've got the support of the crowd. The whole of Australia is lifted due to this, and I, I really feel proud to be here. Well, I hope it all goes well for you, Paul. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Lou. Support of the crowd and support of Sarah Jane as well. Now a new feature we all want to hear from you. Yep, we want to hear your questions and your views and the first one off the, the website comes uh, from Barbara Temashi. She asks how much of a Formula car, Formula One car, is reusable from one race to the next and Mark Blundell is the man to respond to that. That's a very good question, Jim. And the answer to that is virtually nothing. This whole car is made of components. This will do the Grand Prix. You'll never see any of these parts in the car again for a race. Why? Because the whole thing is lifed. Every single component has a serial number and a life to go with it. That life is either time or kilometers run. The parts will come off, they will go into the test team and be used from that point onwards. Everything else you see, yeah, the bodywork will be repainted, the rear wing will be checked, the front wings will be checked. You might see it in a Grand Prix further down the line, but pre-assembly parts will be put on for the next race, just to save time. So to me, what is it? It's a massive airfix kit. Cheers, Mark. Thank you very much. The second question off the website is for you, Tony. It comes from Steve Dobson from Berkshire. Have the teams been affected by the winter testing restrictions? To me, it seems they've worked harder than ever in a shorter stretch of time. It did. The whole thing has been terribly compressed. And, and what they spent time doing, all the teams, was working off the computer simulations, working in the wind tunnels, and then the practicality on the track meant they were all going for it in a short space of time. As a result, there were a lot more accidents, a lot of people trying to put in the times quick. Quickly. A lot of people were spoiled by the weather, couldn't get all their testing done. That's shown by people like Jordan, who said, we've run out of time. We, we, we haven't developed this car sufficiently. OK, Tony, thank you very much indeed. Don't forget, we want to hear uh, your questions and observations, and uh, you can give them to the ITV F1 website. There's going to be a live chapter with Max Mosley there. All the details on the website, and we will respond to some more questions before the Malaysian Grand Prix in a couple of weeks' time. We must not uh, forget that Renault are back in Formula One, taking over from Benetton. Jensen Button, well, he just managed a couple of points for the team in 2001, but he's worked himself into great shape to improve this season. 
Well done, that's the way Jen's keep it going. Well done, Yano, keep the pressure on. Last five seconds. Come on, guys, just work hard for this now. Breathe. Everyone knows that fitness is paramount to a modern top line Formula One driver. But if you have to do it, you might as well do it in style. With this in mind, Renault pilots Jensen Button, Yano Trulli, and test driver Fernando Alonso spent a week on a ranch in Kenya. Ching ching. The ranch, of course, conveniently owned by their boss, Flavio Briatore. On the menu, some serious kayaking in the sea, cross country desert sand hiking, and a large slice of male bonding thrown in. Just the kind of thing to get mind and body in perfect shape for a tough season to come. Back in the slightly less glamorous surroundings of a rainy Melbourne, Jensen could only manage 11th place on the grid. It's an improvement on last year, but it's just shy of where he's aiming to be when everything's added up at the end of the season. If we're outside the top 10, we'd, you know, we wouldn't be, wouldn't be the happiest team in the pit lane because I think that's where we should be. That's where we ended up last year and, and we've moved forward from last year. Where I don't think a lot of teams have. And what are your targets for the year? Um, I'd love to get a podium and I think there's a very good chance of that. I'd like to get a win obviously, but I think a podium is uh, it's pretty much certain, I think. Do you feel like there's a bit more expectation on you because it is now your third season, you're even getting established? Uh, no, not really. I think I, I still feel like a kid, but with a lot more experience than before. So. Um, no, it's great. I'm looking forward to the season big time. I just, I'm the, you know, I'm the most happy I've ever been in Formula 1 now and with, with everything, with the, the team and the whole package and everything. And uh, a lot more committed. So. Watch this space, can't wait. We say goodbye then to uh, Benetton. Um, started back in 86, world champions in 95. Their worst season last year. Over to you, Renault. Let's get down to the grid now, shall we, for a sequence that's attracted a widespread acclaim. Now, when ITV's Grand Prix coverage started right here in 1997, we hadn't a clue what would happen down there. We still haven't. It is Martin Brundle's grid walk. Thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the grid. I think there's more cameras and grid walkers down there now than racing cars, but, uh, you know, to be really cool driving a Ferrari up until now, it has to be the very latest drop-top model or something from about 40 years ago. And all of a sudden, a car that's uh, best part of 15 months old seems to be the absolute hot ticket. I mean, for goodness sake, it's only 18 months away from an MOT test. And here it is, absolutely dominating the front of the grid. And uh, Rubens Barrichello on pole. Let's see if we can get a quick word with Rubens. You're going to have to follow me around here, Andy. <coughs> uh, he's, gonna, he's talking to his engineer, so we'll just see if we can uh, cruise in on it and uh, just see if we can understand. He was very late onto the grid, and uh, we know that Michael was changing wing on his car as he was coming to the grid as well, so that's a little bit surprising. But, but quite clearly, something going on down here, and, uh, and Ross too, they're busy. So a little bit of a drama down on the front of the grid, and it's not fair of me to butt in on that, I don't think, at this stage. Clearly, they want to sort some things out. Now, here's an interesting conversation going on. Look, what's going on here? You've got Jean Top, the boss man of Ferrari, Norbert Haag, Mercedes-Benz, Gerhard Berger of BMW. And there was a big meeting in the paddock as well, just before uh, the cars came out onto the grid. So you'd have to be uh, wondering just what's going on. And that's another conversation that I don't think it's particularly smart to wade into the middle of. Gerhard, how are you doing? How's it looking today? Have you got any chance of catching these Ferraris with your BMW Williams? Quite difficult, I would say. I mean, they are in very, very strong conditions. But uh, the weather, it's getting better. We need a little bit of heat. Our tyres work much better if the temperature goes up. So I would say it's going to be very difficult, but you never know. Have you managed to scrub enough tyres? Yes, we did good work on Friday. We did a lot of runs and we really prepared ourselves for the race. So we should be good, uh, good sort out for the race. Now there's a lot of conversations going on between heavy hitters like yourself and deep sort of quiet, whispery conversations. What's going on? What's up? No, it's not uh, quiet. It's just there should be some, some, dis or there's some discussions going on how could be a cost reduction for the future and uh, uh, regulations changes. So there are a few discussions going on, but not really something very discreet. It's, it's just... Uh... But, but why are they happening on the front of the grid just before the race? 
No, we were just sitting together and we were just met each other there. There was no, no obvious reason for No sc scandal and gossip we can tell the people about? No, not, not at all. Good luck. Let's see who else we can find. So uh, Michael Len is second place on the grid. Ralph Schumacher is uh, here, third place on the grid. And uh, where are we going? We want to try and find David Coulthard. Where is DC? Here he is. Got his uh, gladiator's helmet on. Excuse me, Mr. Stewart. Now we're live on the grid. Look, sorry. It's a bye with you, David. An interruption just before the race. Well, Martin Brundle? Never. <laughs> well, can, you do, can you do the interview then whilst I'm yeah. <laughs> right, DC, quick word. I know you're going on. Yeah, I think that uh, we're in a situation where we're racing Williams. Uh, Ferrari are in a bit of a class of their own. You know, anything can happen during the race, of course, but uh, I think if we can get in front of uh, Ralph, then that'll be a good result today. So you're racing for third, you think, today? I think so. I think Friday have got a bit of an advantage. You'd have a smile if they ran into each other in the first corner. That's about all you can hope for, then. Yeah, I'm just curious to know how they managed to sell the strategy to Rubens so uh, Michael can win without him getting upset beforehand. Oh, bitchy. OK, good luck. Let's, let's have a look and see who else we can find. How long have I got left? I've, I've got a minute left. Kimi Raikkonen's got his crash helmet on. He's ready to go. I think McLaren are probably a little bit disappointed with their pace this weekend after their sensational testing form. Everybody now is uh, getting into the cars, I think. Where are, is there any drivers around here? Mr. Mon Mr. Montoya. Now, I just want a quick word from uh, Juan Pablo. Now, he saw me coming. He's gone the other way. He doesn't like talking on the grid. And the one last man I wanted to talk to, Jackie, you're still in my way, was uh, Felipe Massa, who... Um, <coughs> Felipe, a quick word. Your first Grand Prix, how's it feeling? And I'm a little bit exciting, but I think it's normal. I would like to do my best to do a good race. Brilliant job for ninth on the grid. Yes, you must be so pleased. Yes, I'm happy, but I think now it's completely different. The race is the race, and I would like to finish. OK, thank you very much. We're going to head back to the studio. Caroline O'Connor with the Australian anthem.